Our first speaker is going to be Sarah Shore from the Yad Vashem Institute. And she is a graduate of the Ontario College of Art, Toronto, Canada, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In the last 30 years, she's been involved in documentation and research in the Israel Antiquity Authority, the Hebrew University, and above all, the Yad Vashem Museum and uh, Archives. Um, she has a vast list of publications with amazing names like The Mystery of the Cigarette Box, which personally I'm dying to read already, and others as well. And you can, of course, share her a list of publications if you wish. We would be delighted to send them to you. And without further ado, I give you Sarah Shore. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, and I'm sort of going to be a bridge between the general to the particular. Uh, I thank uh, Deirdre's presentation that uh, resonated with me and kind of bridged the gap between the general database people in the morning, because I'll be speaking very much as a database user. Uh, I'm the manager of the artifacts collection, and for those of you who are not familiar with it. I'm not moving, it's not moving. Oh, finally, it reacted. And so those of you who are not familiar with the artifacts collection, uh, I'd like to uh, sort of give you a sort of a view of all sorts of artifacts that we have. There's of course the, what would be considered perhaps the obvious in the artifacts collection, which would be like the yellow stars and the prison camp uniforms. Uh, basically, any the artifacts collection consists of anything which is not a photograph or a document or an artwork per se, which is why uh, we have a sort of different, uh, a different view when we're dealing with actual artworks. I think uh, the, whole thing of provenance research is a little more organized. At any rate, uh, what's uh, the focus of our collection is uh, that most of our artifacts have been received from the survivors themselves or from family members of the victims. Uh, so our collection is very, very personal. And when we don't have a uh, personal connection, uh, what we try to do is to find the face of the person behind the anonymous uh, artifacts, because many of the artifacts in the collection are indeed actually came to us anonymously or with very little information. And today, uh, I'd like to actually concentrate on one of these collections uh, that came uh, as a result of the Nazi plunder. And uh, to tell you not only a personal story, but how the personal story can also give a glimpse of the harsh realities of the Nazis deportations and plunder. And just a word about digital tools. Um, I will present this uh, research showing the use of Yad Vashem's digital databases. Uh, the artifacts collection does have a digital presence on Yad Vashem's website but uh, it focuses on uh, specific stories. In the coming weeks, though, I hope that we will finally have our collection go up as a database per se. So without further ado, I will try to move it forward. Okay, so this is the collection I'd like to uh, present. Uh, this is a collection of so-called anonymous items that uh, we received, uh, I presume most of you are familiar with the JCR, the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Organization uh, that was set up in 1947 to deal with the redistribution of what they called airless Jewish cultural property in the American zone. Now, much of this was uh, silver Judaica, which everybody is familiar with. But there is also uh, quite uh, a fair amount of textiles. 
Now, the textiles are probably have less of a focus in provenance research because most of them, it's impossible to know where they came from and who they belong to. Um, of course, this property, as many of you know, was redistributed after the war. Uh, and uh, most of it went to the United States, to Israel, and uh, to a number of other countries, among them England. Ours came, interestingly enough, through Britain. Now, uh, the collection I want to speak about is a collection of wimples, and I'll tell you in a minute what that means, because many people are probably not familiar uh, whether uh, they're of Jewish heritage or not. Um, I will show a close-up so you can see, but basically these are long strips of linen that have been either embroidered or painted. And uh, these four came to us with uh, a collection of 11 such items. And first, I'll just explain exactly what they are. A Torah binder or wimple, it's a long linen sash that's used to bind a Sefer Torah. It was traditional in some Jewish communities, mostly German communities. And in honor of a boy's circumcision, circumcision ceremony, the uh, swaddling cloth would be embroidered or painted with the child's name and his date of birth. At the child's bar mitzvah, in some uh, traditions or other people say when the child was three, it would be dedicated to the synagogue and used to wrap a Torah scroll. Now this tradition is common, once again, I'll say predominantly in Germany, in particular in Southern Germany, in Alsace and in Moravia. Significantly, the tradition is not found in Polish Jewish communities. So here's a little bit of a close up on the uh, wimple that I'm going to talk about and show you how I found out information both about the child himself and uh, actually ended up coming to the general from the particular. Um, they're always written in a set formula, uh, the name, the son of, the Hebrew date, and a passage, may it be God's will that he grow in Torah to marriage and to good deeds, amen. And this one, to make it easier for those that are not, not that first in Hebrew, uh, this was done for the Gershon and underneath, uh, underneath the name, it says Hamechune Gert, which means his nickname was Gert. So it's Gershon Gert, son of Menachem HaKohen Katzman, who was born on Tuesday, the 17th of Tevet, 5684, which is equivalent to the 24th or 25th of December, 1923. So who was Gershon Gert uh, Katzman and what happened to him? So of course we go first to our own Shoah Names database, which is probably the most uh, familiar of the databases in Yad Vashem. It's under digital collections on the website. And we see that we found uh, a page of testimony given for a Gert Katzman. Uh, the, uh, the date is almost the same. It's out by a year, but that's typical in uh, research. And uh, we see that he's from Kitzingen, a mine place I'm not familiar with, but certainly it's quite a beautiful place. Typical Bavarian town, old ancient town on the Mine River. So then I was able to proceed to the documents archive. And uh, here I found actually uh, more information. There are the collections of Yisko books or memorial books. Um, this is actually unusual to have been digitized in Yad Vashem's database because though Yad Vashem has them in the library, they haven't generally been digitized by Yad Vashem. 
uh, but this one was, and here I was able to find information again. Gerd Gershon Katzmann, born 25th of 12th, 1923 in Kitzingen, gives his address and names of his parents, Emanuel Katzmann and his mother, Frida Katzmann, uh, whose maiden name was Mandelbaum. He also had a sister. And I see at the bottom that there's a deportation date, the 23rd of March, 1942. Uh, this brings me to another document in the Yad Vashem archive, which is the deportation list uh, from uh, Würzburg. Uh, Gerd Katzmann, 25th of the 12th, 1923, deported to Lublin on the 24th of March, 1942. Now, there's yet another database here, the deportations database. A lot of work has been done to gather up as much information as possible about the uh, various deportations from various places. And by entering the date of the deportation, I get a result. And I found uh, in this case that there's actually quite a lot of information. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. So what we know about this deportation is that it was from Nuremberg to Lublin on the 24th of, thir of the 3rd, 42. And we know that it was the second of seven transportations of Franconian Jews. Uh, it was under the command of the Nuremberg Fürth Gestapo, uh, who were so efficient that they had no longer had enough Jews in Nuremberg to fill, uh, to fill the quota. So they instructed the Würzburg Gestapo to fill in the quota from Würzburg and from over 80 towns and villages in Franconia, among them Kitzingen. There were a thousand men, women, and children on this uh, deportation. Not only is there a lot of information and a lot of documentation, both in our archives, and uh, I don't know, the archives has uh, some original uh, documentation and uh, over the years has much of the documentation that's been received from uh, the German archives. Um, but what I was surprised to find in this case was that in Yad Vashem is also a copy of a photo album of the deportation from Kitzingen and Nuremberg. Now this uh, photo album is unusual, but it seems that Dr. Benno Martin, who was the head of the Nuremberg Field Gestapo, uh, directed uh, people to actually document this, doc this deportation and other deportations from Würzburg, uh, including also a film, apparently, by a well-known filmmaker from Nuremberg. And what you can see in at least the first photographs is the Frankischer Hof Hotel, which was where the Jews were assembled before being deported. Now, the more I delved into this, the more I found it of interest, also in particular from the point of view of the plunder, because the detailed documentation preserved also includes the following excerpts. Uh, an inventory of personal belongings, which the deportees handed in together with a declaration of assets. These were included in the documentation. And it also says that the Torah scrolls were handed over to the Würzburg Staatsarchiv, which were integrated into its archive. Now, as you know, all Jews from deported from Germany were requested to hand over their apartment keys and the Gestapo ransacked the apartments and sealed them. So this is what I meant in my introduction by the personal story revealing the mecha mechanics and bringing into focus the harsh realities between the plunder and the annihilation. I wanna go back just for a minute though to um, 
the person who actually gave this page of testimony for Gerald Katzmann, uh, his name was Yossel Cohen. Uh, he identified himself at the bottom of the page of testimony as a member of Kibbutz Yifat. And uh, he writes that Gert was a, a family member. He doesn't indicate who exactly. Uh, but I was lucky enough to be able to track down, uh, Yossel is no longer alive. Uh, the testimony was given in 99. Uh, I managed to track down though Yossel's son and uh, he was able to tell me that Yossel himself was sent with 300 youths to Switzerland and from there to Israel. Uh, from there he came with a group of Zionist youths to Kibbutz Yifat. Uh, this is Yossel in the circle at the bottom here. He also had from his father's album picture of the Jewish day school and synagogue in Mittelzin, Bavaria, which is where Yossel was from. Mittelzin is yet another Franconian uh, town. Uh, Yossel was born in 1929, the son of Isaac Cohen and Sarah Selma, uh, named Mandelbaum. So Gert Katzman's mother was also Mandelbaum. I presume that's where the connection comes. Uh, he also was the only survivor of his immediate family. His parents, Isaac and Selma, and his younger sister, sister Susie, perished in the Holocaust. So, to summarize, of the 11 wimples that we received in this collection, we've been able to connect four to Bavarian uh, communities. Uh, three, definitely, and uh, one only perhaps, and uh, that's to uh, Kitzingen, uh, Obernbreit, and to Wurzburg itself. And uh, basically, uh, we, uh, we've seen, it makes us wonder if, you know, we can't connect them all to similar circumstances and perhaps connected to this a uh, well-documented deportation. Now, all in all, all, we have some 24 wimples in the collection. Uh, most of them have come from, or many of them have come from personal uh, collections, people who, survivors or their children, families who gave them to us. Uh, we have another collection of four that came from an individual who left Nuremberg after the November pogrom of 1938. And the survivor stories, though there we found actually one or two survivors and they're almost invariably related to individuals who read the writing on the wall and left after the November pogrom of 1938, if they were able. Almost all of the wimples in the collection come from communities throughout the Rhine Basin. Of course, it's impossible to draw conclusions from such small collections, particularly when we know that what remained is a very small part or um, percentage of what was destroyed. But what's left to us is to put faces to some of the victims and some of the survivors and to shed light on the long and rich history of what were once lively German Jewish communities that were annihilated. And that's it for now. Thank you.